So uh, I guess this is part two of the Team Losi Double X Mid Motor project. Um, there is some extra detail here that's worth pointing out uh, as I've gone through and assembled the rear assembly of the car. Um, a few things. First, I did have to cut a little bit more of the uh, motor plate that wraps around on the underside because of the way that the pivot block is set up. There is uh, material around certain portions that the, the motor mount will run up against. So I just had to cut away a, little, a, a bit more material there so that when the motor mount comes around, the two screw holes that go through the motor mount uh, line up with the screw holes that go into the gearbox. Because when you mount the mounting screw from underneath, it has to go through all those holes and they have to align. Okay, so I have to cut some extra material there. Um, as far as uh, other material that I cut, you may or may not be able to see this, but right under here, I cut away a little bit of extra material so that I can actually get a screw in here to tighten down both uh, screws for, for, the, for the motor. Now this is kind of a moot point because getting the pinion gear on here does require me to get around this material uh, altogether, <clears throat> which I can't do if the motor is locked down. So I either have to lift this whole assembly up by unscrewing everything at the bottom or I have to uh, basically unscrew the motor and put the motor back in with the pinion gear here and as I'm pushing the shaft through the hole here uh, I'm mounting the pinion onto the motor as I'm mounting the motor and then everything fits together so it's it's a bit of a pain certainly more than it would be in a rear motor configuration or in other mid motor cars to mount the pin, pinion gear here. You could maybe get around this by cutting out uh, this region here, but I want to minimize how much material I'm actually cutting out of this chassis. And even though this is a bit of a headache, it kind of works. Um, the problem I would say that you do have here is the relative lack of adjustability. Uh, right now I'm running an <clears throat> 82 tooth spur gear <clears throat> with a 32 tooth pinion gear which is around the right kind of gearing that I would need for a 17.5 motor. But if you want to go up a tooth or down a tooth, you're kind of stuck because right now the motor mount screws, you, you can't really see it because this gear, uh, gear cover is in the way, but the motor screws are all the way to the left. So I can't go any further to the left. Um, and as it is, this 32 tooth is the biggest I can reasonably fit in here and have and still have good mesh without it being too tight. Uh, now if I wanted to go to a 31 or a 30 tooth I'd have to move the motor inwards for the same spur gear. The problem there is that on this side this post here is blocking the motor from going back this way. So basically the motor is kind of locked into a single position. Again you can remove this material if you want and run a shorter screw here to mount the uh, pivot block if you really want to and that will allow you to move the motor back just a little bit. Personally I don't think that's really worth it. I can get the gearing I want with a 17.5 motor as it is. Um, either you do that or you uh, get a Dremel to these screw holes here and you just make, you extend the slots out further to this direction to the front. So if you want to change the gearing, you use maybe a larger spur gear and then you know push the motor forward a bit. Um, that'll give you a few more options, but really not that much tunability for gear ratio options. This does remind me a bit of the RC10 GTE that I had set up years back with the, uh, what was it? The Dynotech uh, motor mount. The motor mount had really long uh, slots for the screw holes for the motor. But the way that I had the truck set up, I actually couldn't move the motor forward or backward very much at all. So all those that space there on the motor mount was kind of, uh, I couldn't really use it. Kind of the same case here. Uh, but again, I can get the gearing I want, so I'm not too worried. Um, this gear cover here, you do have to obviously cut out material on the bottom to make it clear all of this. Um, so, you know, this is a... Reproduction gear cover is not an original, so I'm, I'm more than happy to just 
hack it up to make it fit here. Seems to fit no problem. Um, other things that I did... Okay, if we're staying on the subject of <clears throat> the gearbox itself, if all you do is just flip this around and do the cutting that I mentioned uh, in the previous video, what's going to happen is you're going to have a gap actually between the bottom of the motor plate and the chassis. And that will result in flex. So as this thing is jumping around on a track, it's going to put stress onto the rear of the, the, the car and it's going to force the chassis to flex. And there's enough of a gap there that if it flexes enough, it might actually snap the rear pivot block. Uh, it would probably end up snapping like right around here if, if you really put a lot of stress on it. So what you really need to do is find a way to pick up the slack between this motor plate and the chassis. Because this motor plate isn't quite a waterfall. It doesn't mount onto the chassis in any way. So I thought about a few options. Ultimately, what I landed on was using, surprise, surprise, a Kyosho part, part number UM733. And what that part is, I happen to have an SC6 lying around here uh, just to show you, is this part right here. And it's a piece of plastic where uh, the plastic kicks up like this. And this is used, I guess, to kind of help. I don't even know why you'd need it because when you mount the motor onto the motor plate, that holds the motor in place. But apparently they have this extra piece here as, I don't know, extra bracing or whatever for the motor to kind of sit there and make sure it doesn't move around. Uh, but thankfully, that's more or less exactly the part you would need here. You do have to cut a little bit out of the flat spot so that this thing can actually fit in without getting stuck. Uh, and you have to mark up the chassis and mark up the whole locations, drill and countersink two more holes, one, two, right here. But once you do that, basically that sits up against the curved portion of this motor plate and prevents it from pushing forward if there's... Uh, you know, stress placed on the chassis from the back. So now the rear of this, I mean, you can see a very tiny amount of movement, but without this, it's really quite flexible. So now it's very rigid, uh, as it should be with a mid-motor arrangement here, uh, you know, to make sure the chassis doesn't flex. So this little part right here is a lifesaver if you're going to do this conversion. Uh, there may be other similar parts from other manufacturers, but I have Kyosho parts lying around, so I used that right here. Um, also make sure when you do this, this part is mounted with two screws as I showed you from the back side. If the screw is too long, it's going to come all the way up through the part and then start pushing up against the motor mount and then that'll make the whole thing flex backwards. So make sure you use the correct length screw so that the screw doesn't push the motor mount and cause this whole thing to flex this way. You just want to mount this part here and not have any extra protrusion from the screw holes. Um, other things, I put this uh, aluminum brace here, uh, I think it's a bulkhead brace, you can find these on eBay. Essentially what happens is when you mount the rear bulkhead onto the chassis, it's kind of sandwiched between the chassis and an extension of the rear gearbox. And that extra plastic there on the gearbox can snap off, I guess, if there's enough stress placed on the tower. So what this brace does is it just... Uh, spreads the load out if there's stress placed on this part so that it, it hopefully doesn't break that extra amount of plastic uh, or material from the gearbox. You don't have to replace the gearbox. So, okay, I got that. And then I put uh, shiny CVDs on it. This car, this particular chassis came with Universals. I had these shiny CVDs from the X5 uh, that's right over there. That was the other project that I did recently. So I just figured I'd throw them on here. Uh, rebuilt the diff, so that looks all fine and good. The slipper pads on this looked in pretty good shape, so uh, I don't think I need to do anything to those yet. Um, one thing about setting up the arms here, so because you're moving the bulkhead and the sh shock tower from the front to the back, or really from the middle of the car to the back, um, that means the shock mounting also moves back. And these arms are not front to rear symmetric. There's only one side of the arms we actually mount the shocks. In rear motor configuration, this is facing forward. But you can't just flip the arm around because the arm is like a, it has sort of a, a dip there in the middle of the arm. 
So what you have to do is take the left arm and move it to the right and take the right arm and move it to the left. But when you make that swap, you want to make sure that you don't swap the hub carriers. So you want the left hub carrier to stay on the left side. If you take the left arm with the left hub carrier and move that all to the right, you go from a negative toe to a positive toe. So you want to make sure that you detach the hub carriers and just swap the arms and put the hub carriers back on. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is for the rear inner hinge pins, uh, these are not captured by any kind of an E-clip. They're not captured by anything other than the motor mount. When this is in rear motor configuration, the, the motor plate, I should say the motor plate, not the motor mount, that has a bit of material that comes down and abuts these hinge pins to hold them in place. Now you don't have that in rear motor configure and mid motor configuration. So you gotta put something else here. And I noticed that the bulkhead has these four holes here, which are convenient mounting locations for some kind of a plate. You can maybe cut it out of Lexan or carbon fiber or fiberglass, uh, something that would mount here and then have maybe some fangs that extend downward just to encapsulate this region here so that if the hinge pin happens to come to move backward, this plate will catch it and keep it from coming all the way out. Uh, you could try to put in uh, a hinge pin with Eclipse. The problem is to keep the hinge pin from coming out this way, the Eclipse has to be on the front side. But when you go to the front side, there's very little space to access between the chassis and the suspension arm where you can actually reach anything in there to get an Eclipse in there. So you don't want to do Eclipse. You just need something to capture the hinge pin on the other side. Um, other things I'm I'm I would like to maybe straighten out <clears throat> the rear shocks. This may be a little hard to see, but the shocks are actually mounted at a slightly forward angle from front to rear. Um, generally, in this profile, it's you want the shocks to be perfectly vertical. If not, it's just as an extra angle to the shocks, which slightly varies the geometry. If you want to be a stickler about it, you know maybe change the types of spacers you use here. Or take you know this spacer and like Dremel it or thin it down just to move this whole thing back just a bit, or maybe even on the shock tower itself, put some spacers between the tower and the bulkhead to move the tower back just a bit to straighten out those shocks. Um, I haven't done that yet. I'm not sure exactly what the best way is to do that, given that these particular shock bushings for the Losi shocks have a specific size, and I don't want to cut those if I don't have to cut them. Maybe this very slight angle is fine enough. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's just about it for the rear. I just have that, that little brace here to make in the back. And I gotta do you know the wing mount and everything. Um, I do have to figure out how I wanna mount the batteries. It looks like these slots here are for mounting like Velcro tape, or I guess Velcro bands to hold the batteries down. I need actual posts with a cover uh, that'll make things quite a bit easier to put a lipo in there. So I got to sort that out. Um, I also have to sort out the body mounting. If you just take a normal double X body, which is, this is the body the car came with, and you mount it, obviously it's going to fit. Maybe you have to trim it a little bit around here just to clear this uh, gear cover. Okay, fine. Um, and you could, you know, Velcro the body against the edges of the chassis. Again, that's all fine and good. But if the car flips over, it's going to land on its roof, and that's going to push this down, which means the bottom edge of the body, when you're, you know, if you're racing, is going to be potentially pushed down below the chassis. It's going to scrape the track. So you want something to hold this part of the body up here, so that if you do land upside down, it doesn't smush the body down, and it ends up like riding like this, you know, for the rest of the race. You don't want that. So I need to find a way to have some kind of a brace here or something just to hold this section up. Um, I'm thinking, you know, maybe if I could find a piece of plastic I have lying around of just the right length that I could mount against this part of the motor plate and just have it extend up like this and then have a piece that goes up just to act as like a plane for the back side of the body to mount on. Okay, maybe that's good enough. Um, let's see. Other things, uh, I'll get to the front when I get to the front. There's a few things that I, that I may change there, but I'll save that for another video. Um, keeping with the rear here, 
the motor setup is also worth pointing out. The way I did this conversion is to just take the, the gearbox and flip it around. Now that gearbox is a three gear gearbox. You have your input shaft, your idler gear, and your diff gear. If you have a three gear configuration in mid motor, normally you'd have the spur gear on this side, the, which is the right, right hand side of the car, and the motor on the left hand side of the car. Because normal rotation for a motor is counterclockwise, and if it spins counterclockwise, the wheels will go forward if the motor's over here and the spur gear's over here. This is now the opposite, which means if I run this motor in forward uh, rotation, the car's gonna drive backwards. So all you gotta do is make sure you have a speed control that supports reverse rotation. And there's plenty of them out there. Uh, I, the the Turnagey Trackstar stuff that I use, uh, like the 120 amp speed control, that supports it. The Reedy Black Box, at least the higher end models uh, support it. Um, the Tekken RS, um, I believe it supports it, but it doesn't support like a forward brake option with reverse rotation. It does forward brake reverse with a delayed reverse with forward and reverse rotation, which I guess, you know, is okay for racing as long as you don't go into reverse. Um, so there's a number of options out there on the market. The hobby wing speed controls, they support reverse rotation. So it's not like a rare option or difficult to find option on speed controls. Just make sure you account for that. And the other thing is, because now the motor is spinning in the opposite direction, you're gonna have to change your timing, right? I have well, the timing stickers over here. It's kind of hard to see on this motor, but maybe if I do this, yeah, you can kind of see right there. You see 45, 30, 15, those markings there are for positive timing angles if the motor is running in counterclockwise direction. If the motor's going backwards, if I have positive 30 degrees timing on reverse rotation, that's really more like negative 30 degrees timing. So I have to rotate the end bell, the, the alignment marks here, so I have to rotate the end bell forward like this so I, so I get to like a negative 30 degree rotation which is gonna be somewhere around here. Uh, so that way I get the advanced timing I need with the quote unquote correct motor rotation direction for this car. So if you don't have a motor that has markings in the negative direction, some of them do, like the Trackstar motors tend to have that. Um, then you just have to basically map out these distances here, these uh, uh, links and just extend that map in this direction here so you can pretty much estimate with reasonable accuracy where your zero point is, your negative 10, your negative 20, and so forth going all the way back. On some motors, it's relatively easy. Like on this here, the sticker is placed on this surface here on the motor. So it should be, shouldn't be too difficult to map this out and extend it out this way. Um, but on something like the Trinity D4, all those markings are on this surface here. It's on a curved surface. So I'd have to find a way to like make a sticker or something like that to map all this out and then take that sticker and then put it over here to get the negative uh, uh, timing uh, uh, locations. Um, so might be a little tricky, but hopefully not too bad. Um, okay. That's pretty much it for the rear of the car. Uh, I can't really think of anything else to mention at the moment. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching.